plain and simple and reliable orgasms that will send me to sleep. That has been the theme of this year, and this has been my friend. Hello everybody, welcome back to my channel and to a very special episode of Pleasure Trove. We are bringing this back for one final episode. It has been a while since I hosted one of these. We had a lot of amazing guests over the last like year and a half, two years hosting episodes of Pleasure Trove, which has been so fun. The last one that I did, I was pregnant still. So that's how long it has been since I've done one of these. But if you didn't know, Pleasure Trove is a series where we talk about media and culture all in the realm of sex and relationships. and. This is gonna be like my sexy faves of 2023. So let's dive in, starting with books, of course. But if you watch my channel, you will know that your girl has only read one sex-related book this year, and it was definitely a fave. Mating in Captivity, Unlocking Erotic Intelligence by Esther Perel. I did a whole video about all the things that I learned from this, but this is definitely like a fave of all time. I love Esther Perel. I remember when I watched her first TED talk when I was at uni, the one all about kind of like the premise of this book, which is about security and desire in long-term relationships and how our need for security often like is at odds with sexual desire and how do you navigate that in a relationship? How do you bring in mystery and uncertainty into what you want to be a stable and secure relationship in order to create sexual desire? Fascinating stuff, I love this. But I remember seeing that TED talk when I was at uni and just showing it to anyone and everyone who I knew was in a relationship. I'd be like, you have to watch this video. So yeah, it's an oldie, but it's a goodie. Next, I wanted to talk about some of my fave podcasts of the year because I may have not had time to read but I've had lots of time to listen. Of course I want to massively shout out my podcast Doing It. This has been one of my favorite things to work on this year. We did this incredible like deep dives series that we're working on for like the entirety of the last half of this year. All of the episodes are out now. There are five of them, each of them diving into a different theme. So there's sex therapy, disability, money, porn, and parenting, and how all of those different things intersect with sex and relationships. It was such a joy to work on, but it was also like one of the biggest challenges of this year because it was doing something in a format that we'd never attempted before. And just massive shout out to my team, Mia and Anushka, who like worked so hard on this podcast as well. And it was like so fun to, yeah, just like experiment with this new format, be like, we don't know what we're doing, but we're gonna try. And honestly, I think the outcome of it is so special and I'm so proud of it. In terms of podcasts that I've had nothing to do with the making of, but thoroughly enjoyed listening to, I would highly recommend If Books Could Kill. This is, a Michael Hobbs podcast hosted with his friend Peter something. <laughs> Sorry, Peter. Basically, the format of the show is that one of them reads a like best selling self help book, like those airport books, those ones that like everyone's kind of heard of or seen, and they read it and research into it and kind of explain the story. <laughs> to the other one and they have a big chat kind of debunking a lot of the stuff and the stories around it. It is so funny, it is so interesting and the reason why it's made it into Pleasure Trove is because a good amount of the books that they have like reviewed essentially have been like relationship self-help books and these episodes have been some of my favorites and they are so good. I would honestly not really recommend you read any of these books, but I would recommend you listen to these episodes. So they cover Men Are From Mars, Women Are From Venus, The Game, The Rules, and The Five Love Languages. And ooh, it's so interesting. They are so funny, but also they really dive deep and do their research and would recommend. Honestly, excellent. Love to see it or hear it. And then my next podcast fave, I believe it only just started like later this year, but I have been absolutely loving and it is a Fit Fruity with Matt Bernstein. You may recognize Matt Bernstein's Instagram posts. <laughs> like I knew the style of his Instagram posts before I knew his name because 
because there are always a lot of the like infographics that get shared around like political events or like around social justice stuff. And he always has really thoughtful things to say about it. And he started a podcast. And for me personally, in terms of the way that I consume news and media and things, I much prefer the long form podcast to the like infographic on Instagram. But some of the episodes that he's done so far that I thought were really, really good were the one on LGBT conservatives with Natalie Wynn, AKA ContraPoints. There was one all about Amber Heard and the myth of the perfect victim. And this was a really great episode for me because I very much did not engage with the trial, the trials when they were happening and when it was kind of like all over the internet and all over the media and the news. And so I just knew it was a hot mess. And I was just like, I don't have time for this. Like, that's just not something that I need filling my brain. And so it was really good now for like a year later for me to listen to this and be like oh that's what kind of happened and this is why it's really important and relevant still yeah if you are also someone who is very confused and overwhelmed by what the hell was happening with all of that would recommend the listen and also at the time of me filming this the latest episode that I listened to was all about queer Palestinians and pinkwashing and in that episode I learned the term homo nationalism which is a really great term because that's definitely something that like I've experienced in my education education here in Britain and growing up and it's really great to like have a word for it but essentially it's about weaponizing homophobia to just fuel racism especially in terms of what western standards are for like gay rights and then when we compare that to other countries especially Muslim countries and black and brown countries where they have less of those rights and then using that against those countries and against those people. And then they also really go into in this episode the argument that gets weaponized against a lot of queer people who stand in solidarity with Palestine when people say that queer people wouldn't be safe if they visited or went to Palestine. And so they kind of break down that awful argument that is very much done in bad faith. There was also a lot of stuff in that episode that was really interesting and I didn't know like the full scope of in terms of like brand marketing for countries and pink washing and all of that so yeah would recommend next up is Instagram and I want to shout out my favorite new follow of 2023 of this year towards the beginning of this year I met Carolina Are who is a pole dancer and social media researcher I met her at Eroticon back in March so on her Instagram you will find a beautiful mix of like incredible pole dancing videos and then her talking all about her work and her research Research. So she is like an anti-censorship activist. She does so much amazing work in like the community that I'm in in terms of like sex educators and sex workers who are creating content online and a lot of the like shadow banning and censorship and harassment and you know accounts being taken down or posts being taken down that people face and she does a lot of work helping people like get their accounts restored and you know talking directly with Meta to help with like content policy guidelines and all of that things not that Meta ever really listens to her but they should. Also some of her research that has been peer reviewed has recently been published and it's open access, which means that anybody can read it, we love it. And this research was all about targeted harassment campaigns and the misuse of the flagging tool on social media platforms, especially on like Instagram and TikTok where a load of people will like flag a creator's profile with the intention of getting it deleted. And she was specifically looking at marginalized creators, sex workers, journalists and activists. And yeah, I'll leave that in the description for you to check out if you are interested and she's amazing go follow her okay my tv faves of the year da, da, da. i mean of course i have to talk about sex education season four the final season of sex education i feel like this show has like followed me throughout my career sex education finished this year my sex ed work has finished this year it, it just feels feels right but i love this show one thing that i found really interesting watching it was just like how different my life stage was was now in season four than it was in season one, even though there's not been like that many years in between them all. But when watching season one, you know, you're like trying to relate to the young people, you know, like young at heart and like they're the protagonists. And so, you know, in your head, you're the protagonist of your own life. And so like you're relating to the young people in it when really I was more the same age as their teachers. But now with this season with Jean, Otis's mum having a new baby and living that newborn 
newborn life and navigating postpartum depression and work and parenting and like all of that stuff, I was like, oh, that's my life stage. I'm actually the parents of the protagonists. So that was a reality check for me watching this season of like, oh, okay, yeah, that's, that's who I'm relating to now when I'm watching young adult TV shows. <laughs> I haven't really talked about what I thought of the final season of Sex Education anywhere online yet, so I'm gonna do that now here, kind of. <laughs> In general, I loved it. I think the essence of the show really like stayed true throughout. We had more like disability rep and trans rep and asexual rep in this season. Obviously there was like that big school move. And so we got rid of a lot of older characters and then they brought in new ones, which isn't unusual for sex education. They always kind of like do bring in like new people each season, but there was this element of like, oh, it's the final season. So like how much of a satisfying arc are we gonna get for these new characters that we've only just met? But I still think that they were really like amazing additions and really cool characters, even if we didn't get like the same depth with them as we got with the characters who we've been with since season one. In terms of that depth, I honestly thought that the arcs and the endings that Amy and Eric got were my favorite. I love those two characters. They're just my favorite. I want to protect them both at all costs. They are so funny and so charming and I think their endings were really beautiful. I thought the storyline that they did with Viv this season was really interesting with the like early signs of emotional relationship abuse with the love bombing. I don't think I'd ever like seen love bombing like play out on screen. And I'm really glad for that representation because actually like when watching it, it took me a while to realize what was happening because at first you're like, oh, this guy's interested in Viv, like go her, like this is great. That's kind of like, what love bombing feels like at the beginning. Like it's a positive thing. It's like really exciting that this person is paying attention to you and like doing nice things for you and sharing your gifts or whatever. And then it was just like, oh wait, hang on a second. What's going on here? And I think it was honestly a shame that they had to fit that storyline into just one season because it did feel rushed. And I think that could have been like really powerful played across a longer timeline. But I still liked seeing an example of love bombing on screen. Those are some of my main takeaways in general I absolutely loved this season and like all seasons of sex education one of my favorites of all time love it would love to hear your thoughts on the season as well in the comments if you want to share and then another tv fave is this short documentary that Netflix put out called the dads and it's essentially this group of American dads and they go off fishing together but yeah they essentially do that they got this group of dads together and they're all dads of trans children and they're just talking about dads and they're talking about their kids and they're, you know, talking about gender and masculinity and their role as parents and like how to care for their trans children, especially like in America where it can be very hostile and a lot of the laws and stuff that are being passed at the moment in terms of stripping back the rights of trans people, especially trans youth. And it's just a very short 11 minutes. It's very wholesome. I cried, it was beautiful. And it was really cool to see like conversations like that. I wish it was longer. I don't know why it was only 11 minutes. I wanted more, but would recommend. Next up is events. Now I went to two very cool events this year in the sex and relationships realm. One was Esther Perel's talk, which again, I talked about in that video where I talked about her book and her talk that she gave and that was just so fun. And it was also just like super fun to like go with a bunch of my like sex educator, sex nerdy friends. It felt like, you know, we we're all like on this school trip together. It was really, really fun. And then the other thing that I went to was one of Emma Louise Boynton's sex talks. I interviewed her for my podcast and she hosts this series of like live events called sex talks all on different themes. And I went to the one where where she was interviewing Laurie Nunn, who is the creator and writer of sex education. And it turns out that Laurie has a child similar age to Rowan, and then was just like back in the writer's room, like just a few weeks after her kid was born. And I was just like, what? <gasps> what? Anyway, it was really cool to hear her talking about how the series Sex Education came to be and the screenwriting process and all of that. Love it. Next up is film. And I've basically only really seen one film this year and I've seen it three times. And that is Barbie. 
And I wanted to talk about Barbie for a sec because it is definitely a fave of mine this year. The first time I went to see it, I was blown away. I was like, oh my goodness, this is incredible. And I remember just kind of enjoying it at that level. I did remember upon first watch during Gloria's monologue, the monologue, just kind of being like, mm, that was fine. Like it didn't really hit me in the way that I've seen it kind of being portrayed in like the news and the media in terms of being this like hugely incredible radicalizing thing. But everyone needs their first contact with feminism and if it's through the Barbie film then do you know what I'm fine with that. And it is really easy to criticize the film because obviously Mattel funded it but you know what I'm choosing to just enjoy it at the level that I believe Greta Gerwig intended for us to enjoy it at. <laughs> Not that I've seen any interviews with her, so maybe I'm wrong in terms of her intentions. But I thought it was hilarious. I thought it was joyful. I've had I'm Just Ken on repeat. I love that song and the whole performance of it and that scene in the movie. I think for me, it's like one of those films that is so joyful and rewatchable and yet is gonna be one of those ones that's like in appropriate times, like easy to pick apart and kind of fun to pick apart as well. There are a lot of films that I enjoy on that level like Love Actually is one of those where it's just like pure joy so rewatchable so funny and yet if you think really hard about it you're like yikes um <laughs> And Barbie sits in that category for me and I love that for it. Okay, finally, I'm gonna show you some physical things and talk about some stuff. So I know I got these done last year, but it was towards the end of last year and they've basically been sitting on my shelves all year. And that is, da 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 da. Look at these majestic beasts. These are my boobs. This is my vulva and these are casts that were done by Lydia Reeves. And I did a whole video of the process of getting these done. And I just love that my tip and my vulva have been just like sat in the background of like all my videos this year. And because I am moving out of this studio next year, I've handed in my notice, all of this stuff is coming back home. So my boobs and my vulva are gonna be moved to the bookshelves in our bedroom. I did think about like, could we put them on the shelves in the living room? And I thought, no. <laughs> I'm not that bold. I don't I don't want to do that. And then also, da, 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 this is also going to take pride of place. This I think I might put in the living room. What do we think? This is the dildo that I created with Adele and Scotty. And yeah, there's a whole video of like making this as well. And this is just beautiful. And it wouldn't be a pleasure trove sexy faves of the year if I didn't tell you about my favorite sex toy of the year. And this is by no means a new sex toy. This is just the one that has seen me through this year been my reliable buddy source of pleasure this year and it is my love honey bullet thing and once again it's got a case it's got a case it's like this little travel thing space for your charger and this is it this is all it is I think I've had this toy for over a decade I think this was like one of the first toys that I ever owned but my masturbatory habits this year have very much not been about trying new things they have not been about exploration they have not been about new frontiers <laughs> or excitement. It has been about plain and simple and reliable orgasms that will send me to sleep. That has been the theme of this year and this has been my friend. <laughs> And that's all I have to say about that really. It's just your bog standard bullet, but it's just very good quality, very reliable, very durable, long lasting, and it comes with its own case. And I love that for me. And seeing as with this big career change that I've got coming up, I'm not gonna have many more chances to promote my affiliate links for all these sex toys where you can get discounts and the likes. I'll promote them now, check them out. Links in the description. There's also my essential shop, which you can go through. This is listed on there and discounts are all automatically applied there. And there's some videos of me reviewing lots of other toys on there too that you can go check out. But yeah, love me, my love honey bullet. And that is it. Those are my sexy faves of the year. Have you listened to, read, watched, used any of the things that I've mentioned? What were your sexy faves of the year? I would love to hear from you in the comments. Next week, we have a very special episode of Drunk Advice. I cannot wait. Also, at the time of posting this, we are mid Vlognica. So if you want more of me, then you can head over to the More Hannah channel. There are videos coming out every day there over the eight days of Hanukkah. I hope that you're all doing well and I'll see you in the next video. Bye!